There we go. So we have a... Howdy. So we are live now. Um, the, uh, we are... Yeah, I'm going to try the new, uh, new one. Last, uh, the lamppost um, had its chance, but uh, we're going we're gonna to try the new slim down model, and uh, hopefully it will work. We will uh, we'll kind of wait and see on that. Um, but Lord willing, it will be okay, and um, we'll be able to have good, have good results from it. I'm crossing my fingers. I, I do have something. We are going to be using this. I've got something coming from Amazon. That will hold the camera or hold the uh, cell phone a little better, and uh, with that, it'll cross fingers. Um, we'll do we'll do okay with it. So, oh my! Well, it's a little past seven o'clock. Um, so, to all those that are in uh, on our Facebook feed right now, um, we did get started just a little bit later. But thank you so much for tuning in. It's great having y'all with us, and uh, we do hope the Lord blesses you tonight. Uh, during our service, um, if uh, you want to, you can go ahead and uh, tell other people about uh, the Facebook page and uh, also our Instagram, our Twitter, um, and also our uh, YouTube channel, um, as all of the services are also posted up there uh, if you'd like to be a part of that. So um, if you can give us a like, that would be wonderful. Um, I know our secretary is posting some wonderful things on all the social media. Um, just about, uh, I won't say just about every day, but um, she's trying to get all the information out of things coming up. So if you want to be connected there, you certainly can. It's good having everybody out tonight. And uh, we've, got a, we've got an odd evening before us. It's getting dark outside. And uh, lo and behold, we might have rain, but what a blessing it is to uh, have cooler temperatures and don't have to worry about sweating. Uh, though I will admit, I'm... I'm I'm almost on that brink of sweating because I'm, I'm up here and I'm in a suit and all. So, um, but that's all right. I'm, I think that's, that's always going to happen. We're going to have snow on the ground outside. I'll probably be the same way. Um, but uh, as we go to the Lord in prayer tonight, uh, who can we lift up? Who can we pray for this evening? I know we need to continue to remember our nation. Um, I, I did get in uh, touch with Gene. And uh, he said that things were going good with Kay, so um, I praise the Lord for that. I want to keep having uh, good news. Uh, talk to uh, Kathy as well, and uh, she said she was she was doing good. I think she said she'd had four straight uh, good days, so um, that was a that was a big blessing there. So praying for for more good days there as well, and uh, so that's. It's one of the things I think I'd also seen on the news that uh, our COVID cases have kind of gotten to where um, the state wanted them to be. So um, we're going to see if that, that holds true. So uh, hopefully um, some good things will be in the, in the works for the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, please remember all of those that have been affected by this latest hurricane. Uh, as it had slowed down, and I know a lot of devastation had come there. So please remember them uh, in your prayers. Um, haven't heard anything from Allison's family. I think they were a little bit out of the way of this one, so praying that uh, things would be all right there. Um, Allison did get to talk to her brother in Norway uh, today. He had given a call, and uh, things thankfully are going well there. Uh, in the hospital, uh, he said he does wear a mask, but thankfully things have gotten a good amount better uh, there, so we're, we're very grateful for that. Um, so good news, good, uh, good things to be happy about all around. Um, any, anyone else, anything else we can pray for this evening? Well, let's go before the Lord tonight. Remembering these that have been mentioned, as well as those that are on our hearts. Father God, Lord, we, uh, we come before you tonight, giving you thanks and praise for your many blessings, your guidance and direction in, in our life. And Lord, as we have so many things happening in our country and, and at home, we want to lift them up to you now to take control of our nation and our land, that you would be glorified, that you would you would 
work in a mighty way. Um, that our nation would come together to be healed and to get through this pandemic that we are in. We pray that you would help us through this political season. Um, Father, help our, our hearts to be calm. And uh, Lord, I, I pray that you would help peace to reign. Uh, for the many, many that are affected now by the hurricane that has just hit on the Gulf Coast, we pray for safety and health for all of those that are involved there, especially the, the first responders that are going and, and uh, going and rescuing others. We pray that the efforts to rebuild and to do well uh, in, in bringing everything back to normal would go quickly um, and that that this would be a, a process that would just swiftly happen. Uh, Father, we, we thank you for the good news. Um, and Lord, we, we want to lift up the many that are on our hearts that are sick and upon the beds of affliction, those that are in need of your healing touch and also of strength. We pray that you would guide and direct as only you can. Father, we, we lift all these things into your hands. We pray that you guide and direct our thoughts tonight we study your word once again, for it's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and be turning back to Ephesians chapter 6. Um, we're going to be looking again at the armor of God as we continue our series in preparing for battle. Um, each week, I have been uh, entitling the messages uh, on a hymn. And uh, this week is no different. I have entitled the message, The Solid Rock. And the reason why is it connects so well to what we are talking about, the breastplate of righteousness. And I wanted to give you the, the story behind this hymn, because I thought it was absolutely incredible. A lot of times we, we hear these hymns that have come from people that have written a thousand hymns or 2,000 hymns or just wrote whole books. This one is a little different. Um, the Solid Rock was written by an individual called Edward Moat. And uh, interestingly, he said this about his life. So ignorant was I that I did not know there was a God. My Sundays were spent on the streets of London in play. Those were the words of Edward Moat who rose from an unruly childhood to become a great writer and minister. He composed only one song, but a great song it is, indeed. It has been a favorite of people around the world. In his early adult years, Moat attended Tottenham Court Road Chapel, where he heard sermons by the noted John Hyatt. He soon learned from Hyatt's sermon that Jesus Christ could take away all the fears of life and could give him the peace of heart and mind that he had long desired. He became a carpenter's apprentice and through hard labor and conscientious effort came to own his own cabinet shop. One day while walking to his work, he began thinking that he should write a hymn. Before he reached his shop, he had the chorus. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Before the day ended, he had four stanzas. The following Sunday, he visited in the home of a friend, a minister whose wife was at the point of death. During the afternoon, they read from the scriptures and prayed with her. As the preacher looked for a, hymn, a hymnal to sing from, as was his custom, he could find none. Mutt reached into his pocket and pulled out his verses and asked if they might be sung to her. And so they were, and she seemed to enjoy them very much. Mutt was pleased that she found comfort in his verses, and he had a thousand copies printed for distribution among his friends. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Sometime later, Edward Moat became a Baptist preacher. His efforts made it possible for a house of worship to be built for his congregation. They were so grateful they offered to deed the property to him, but he replied, I do not want the chapel, I want only the pulpit, and when I cease to preach Christ, then turn me out of that. 
He served this congregation for more than 20 years, never missing a single Sunday for any cause. In his 77th year, as he lay on his bed of sickness, he replied, I think I'm going to heaven. Yes, I am nearing port. The truths I have preached I am now living upon, and they will uh, do to die upon. Ah, the precious blood which takes away all our sins. It is this which makes peace with God. What an amazing story. He was reared in a godless home, learned an honorable trade, and gave it all up to become a preacher. His memory will re remain for generations because he took one time, he, he took time one day to actually write a hymn. And that is actually in your, your notes. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, his blood some support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found. Mark this one line. Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. That's an amazing thing to think about. He wrote one song, and I bet this one song is in every single one of the hymnals I have in my office. But it's such a powerful song. And it talks a lot about the righteousness of Christ. And that's what we're talking about, because we're talking about the breastplate of righteousness. So that's the second piece we're going to be looking at. We've, we've looked at two things. We've looked at the idea that we are in spiritual warfare. Each and every day, there's a battle that goes on within our hearts and within our lives. There's a battle that goes on within us and outside of us in the spiritual realm. The devil tries to tempt us. The world is out there. Everything that is sinful is out in the world today. And we're in a battle. Therefore, we need what God has supplied. And God has supplied us some great things in the armor of God. And the first thing we saw was the belt of sincerity, the belt of truth. That first and foremost, we have to have a heart that is committed to the glory of God. And that is the first thing. We have to be sincere in our heart. And if we have that sincerity, if we are ready, if we truly are children of God, then we can go forward and begin putting that on our own. And the very first piece is the breastplate of righteousness. Just real quick, I want to look at, make three observations. Let's look at three things. Just like we did last week about this breastplate of righteousness. The first one is the breastplate itself. In Roman times, the breastplate was, was made of bronze. It went from the neck here down to the nape. And it had a very specific purpose. It was to guard the shoulder of the soldier against any type of an attack that would come his way. If it was a sword thrust, it would protect him. If it was a spear that was being thrust at him, it would protect. A javelin that had been thrown, it would protect. Or an arrow that had been shot. Because here, between the neck and the navel, are all the vital organs. You have the lungs, you have the heart, you have the stomach, the kidney, the liver, everything that we need that is so vital to life. And what this breastplate does, did was it protected those vital organs. So that is the idea of the breastplate. You can get the idea of a soldier wearing this and how essential a breastplate actually is. But what is this other part? The other part, beyond the breastplate, is righteousness. Number two is righteousness. The Apostle Paul says that the Christian's breastplate is righteousness. Righteousness is defined as moral and spiritual uprightness, such as it is seen 
in the character of God. And of course, the question that we always have is, what in the world is righteousness? You know, what in the world is, is righteousness? Uh, Jerry Falwell at uh, Liberty University, when, when Allison and I were there, would, um, would always talk in, in Sunday school or um, in Sunday morning service at Thomas Road Baptist Church. Um, he would give uh, this one speech about how he learned how to tithe. And he said, when I was growing up, I was in church, and I would always, uh, I would always look, and I would see these envelopes. And he finally asked somebody, he said, what does tither mean? What does it mean to be a tither? And the guy was like, I don't know what that word means. And he's like, spell it for me. He's spell it. Oh, it means tithing. I think righteousness is one of these words that we go in and we're like, I hear it, and I, 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 I talk about it a lot, but, you know... What does it mean? How many of y'all ever had that? Any of the words that you've ever read or, or seen or heard a preacher talk about? And you're like, I don't know what that word means. I've had words I've said that I probably don't know the complete meaning of. The idea of righteousness has to do with right actions, right standing, right in behavior, justified morally, ethically. It, it's upright standards of Morality. You ever known a, known a kid that was like super, super good, that was just amazingly good, that you're just like, I love that child. That child just, just does right. right. Let me ask you different. You ever got a child that's like, what in the world went wrong? The batteries are in wrong on that kid. Don't, don't think about it right now. But you, you know what I mean. The idea that somebody's just, child does right. That's the idea of the idea of being righteous. That every little thing they do is, is upright and good. So when we're talking about the idea of righteousness before God, that means someone who does right, not only inwardly, but outwardly, according to every single one of God's standards. The Greek New Testament word for righteousness primarily describes conduct. It's contrasted with wickedness and the conduct of one who is self-centered or doesn't respect God at all. So that's the idea of what is talked about in, in the Bible when it talks about righteousness. But here's the, here's the thing. There's two types of righteousness when it talks about Christian. A and B, here it is. There is imputed righteousness and imparted righteousness. Imputed righteousness and imparted righteousness. Let me uh, give the difference between those. Uh, how many of y'all know somebody that's part of a sports team? Some type. Wes, uh, and that's Kent, and he's baseball team, right? Yes. All right. Is Hunter, anybody? What are they on? Not right now, but has been football. Has been football. Any other sports? Baseball. Baseball. Any more? Not yet, right? Who knows? Could be golf, could be tennis, could be anything. So the idea of an imputed righteousness is the idea of, of making a team. That once you get on a team, you're part of that team, right? I, I knew someone back when Allison and I first got married that told me that right out of high school, he was drafted by the Atlanta Braves. He was super amazingly good at baseball, and they were like, hey, we want you. But he said, well, you know, I, uh, I really would have rather gone, I wanted to go to college for a little bit, I wanted to hone my skills, and then I would have been like, yeah, I'd go for it. And he always regretted that because if you are drafted and you are a part of a major league baseball team, you would get a baseball card made after you. He said, man, I would have been the same as anybody else that had ever gotten a baseball card. I would have been in the same league as them. The idea of imputed righteousness is the idea that when we come to Christ, we take all of our bad stuff, all of the times that we have ever failed. Raise your hand if you've ever failed at something, done wrong at something. Anything like that, you know, we've all done that. And the idea of all of those wrong things, and Jesus, 
Christ has done all the right things. The idea of getting Christ's righteousness is, at salvation, God says, all right, yes, you have not done right, but Christ has done right. Therefore, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all of the righteous living, all of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and I'm going to wrap you in it. I'm going to impart it to you. I'm going to impute, fancy word, which means to give. I'm going to put all of those things, and it's not going to be your unrighteousness anymore that I'm seeing. I'm going to see the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Just as if you were a part of the team, it meant 100% you were on that team. Baseball card, you're in the major leagues. Here it is. That's the idea of Christ. He comes and surrounds us, and when God looks at us, he does not see our unrighteous sinfulness. He sees Christ's righteousness. But you know, there's a second part of this, too. That's the imputed. What about the imparted righteousness? The imparted righteousness. Here's the second part. So, did, did any of the, uh, did anybody, when they, were, when they were part of the team, did any of them have to do anything special? Have to act a certain way, do anything special in that respect. What was what are some of the stuff? Uh, the coach don't want them to have really long hair, so they had to make sure they had shorter haircuts. You get a haircut every once in a while, right? Anything else? Any other special ones? Any special diets or? No, I mentioned that the shirts always have to be tucked in when on the field. Oh, there we go. Tucked in. Has to look a certain way. And uh, would shoes have to be tied and? Have to be a certain. It'd be a certain, certain color. Certain material. They, okay. See, it'd be all, all, those, all those different things. Anything, anything else that, you know. I know, um, I know I've heard uh, some stories with Coach Schreiner about, you know, some of his workouts that uh, he, he brought the kids through that were uh, somewhat legendary. So here it is. When you get on the team, you're 100% a part of the team, but there's expectations in there, right? Things you got to do. Because you're a part of the team, not because of anything else other than the fact that you're part of that team. The righteousness of Jesus Christ places us within the family of God. The imparted righteousness is the Holy Spirit of God is given to us that we, in fact, might live for Christ. Romans 3 and verse 10, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Um, you know what? I'm going to do this. I'm going I'm to skip ahead here. All those verses have to deal with all of these things. Have to deal with the idea of righteousness and all of those things uh, that are in there. But Ephesians chapter 4, I'm going to have to skip down. Put away um, as concerning your former way of life, the old man, and put on the new man who is the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. Romans 6, verses 11 and thir through 13. Thus also consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, don't let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. Neither present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as alive from the dead in your members as instruments of righteousness. To God. Philippians 1 verse 11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. So the idea is, when we have the righteousness of Jesus Christ, God looks at us and says, you are righteous. Not because of what you've done, but because of what Jesus did. But all of that comes with a purpose. That we should, as we've read and, and looked at in Galatians, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless, I, I don't live, but Christ lives within me. It's the idea that we'll see in, in Galatians chapter 5 that we live by the Holy Spirit of God. We have all of these things. Just as a child might get onto a, a, a sports team, they got a little bit of a change to do then because they're a part of it. They've got little, little standards they have to meet. Um, I know that for any of the wrestlers, they have to watch their weight. Because they might be in like this one weight category, but they might be like two pounds from this other one. The coach is like, look, I want, you to, I want you to stay in this weight category. 
So, you know, don't get the third double cheeseburger, just get two. It's the idea of saying, hey, there's a purpose for what you're doing right now. There's a calling upon your life. So here's the thing. That's the idea of righteousness. We have the idea of what a breastplate actually is. So what does it mean to have the breastplate of righteousness? Let's consider how imputed and imparted righteousness corresponds to a breastplate in our spiritual life. Number three, obviously, is the breastplate of righteousness. See, here's the thing. In spiritual warfare in which we live, if the devil's going to get a, a foothold on our life, if the devil is going to go after us, if the devil is going to win or we're going to have sin in our back end, he's got to get a foothold somehow. He's got to get into our life to kind of mess things up. And there will be many, many darts, many different ways he is going to try to do that. But righteousness, both imputed and imparted, can guard and or protect our heart from Satan's attack. See, one of the, one of the big ways we stumble, uh, what, let's, let's go back and, and do a little Bible trivia. What comes before a fall? Pride. Pride. I can do it myself. Uh, usually these are the words you hear before you go to the ER. I'm fine. I don't need any help. Have you ever heard those before? <laughs> Up on a ladder, you know, doing something, and it's like, I don't, I don't need any help or anything like that. If the devil can get us to think that way, oh, oh, that's that's just not gonna, not good. If we can, if he can get the idea of pride within us, well, I'm all right. I can handle, handle all this stuff. Oh, let's go this way, too. What, what kind of things do we face spiritually? What kind of battles do we face on a regular basis when it comes to our spiritual life? What kind of things do we deal with? Doubt and fear. Doubt, fear. What else? Temptation? Any temptation out there? How about, how about the attacks on all of our senses? Our flesh with lust, our eyes with, with greed, our ears wanting to tickle our ears with things. All of these things are, are attacked. And you know, the way in is the idea of pride. The way in is the idea of saying, well, I don't need God to fight this battle. I don't need God because I am strong enough. That's a horrible place to be. Because how many of y'all know, without God, you're going to fail at something? I can name plenty of mine. It's the chip aisle at the grocery store. Now, that, that's my way. I was telling Stephanie that today. I don't know what we were talking about, but we got onto the, we got on potato chips. And I'll tell you what, I know this for a fact. That is like my weakness. And I, I have to stay away from it. You know, the way in which I conquer that battle so I don't eat, like, a family-sized bag of Doritos twice. The, the way I, I make sure I don't do that is I don't get around them. I'm like, nope. You know, I can do all things through Christ, like leaving these things away and not getting close to them. That's the idea. When the devil comes and gives you that idea of, ah, you don't need that. Which, if you want an easy way to think about that, how, how foolish would it be if we go all the way back into Paul's day and you go up and you see a Roman soldier? And a Roman soldier says, ah, oh, I don't need this breastplate. I'm going into battle and just rips it off. He's got all these muscles and he's got a sword and he's got his shield and I don't need that. What would you say to him? You know, you'd be like measuring him for a coffin, wouldn't you? <laughs> How high, high are you? Do you have a burial plot anywhere? Because what's a sword going to do to somebody without armor? It's going to go through that muscle real quick, isn't it? 
Yet how often do we do the exact same thing? Oh God, I don't need to worry about what you want me to do. I'm all right, I'm strong. Let me put it in a different sense. Let's put it in a contemporary sense. In a contemporary manner, rather than a breastplate, what, what's something contemporarily that people wear here for protection? A seatbelt in the car. Seatbelt in the car. Bulletproof vest, both of those, excellent. Because they protect you against things that no matter how fit you are or how good you are, you're not going to survive. Head on collision, oh, I don't need that seat belt. I'm good. No, no, that, that force is too great. Oh, I'm all right. Those bullets, no, I'm, I, I lift. You know, I go to the gym when it's open. If it ever gets open again. I'm a, I lift. I'm all right. No. No, they're not going to bounce off of you. The same mentality has to be within our life. But we can't let that pride. And this is the, this is the idea of imputed righteousness um, and imparted righteousness, how it helps us. Because if each day we understand that I desperately needed the righteousness of Jesus Christ because in and of myself, I got nothing. I, I can't do it on my own. I couldn't get to heaven on my own. I needed Jesus Christ. It reminds me so much that I need Jesus each and every day of my life. And that's the idea. Saying, Jesus, it's all about you. I want to make sure I please you and do everything I can in my life to lift your name on high. And God, because I just want to, to acknowledge the fact I can't do it on my own. But you know the other, other thing that y'all have mentioned that is so, so true, and that's the idea of doubts. You ever had this thought go through your mind before? I'm no good. I'm not good enough. I, I can't measure up. I'm a failure. You think, think about this. Think about how many people that are out in our world today Think that or have heard that. That's a lot of it. That's one of the fiery darts of the devil. You're no good. You're never going to be any good. You might as well not try to be good. God's never going to accept you. God's never going to think good of you. You might as well not even give him any credence whatsoever. Just forget about God and go live your life in the old way. Those are the fiery darts that the devil throws, and the devil throws them constantly. But here's the breastplate of righteousness. That when we put it on, we understand two amazing things. Number one, God does accept us. That he loves us with an everlasting love so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. That he would live that perfect life that we couldn't live. That he died and was buried and rose again. That when we accept him by faith, it is not my failures that God sees, but rather the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And every single day I can get up and I can know, yes, I have my failures, but you know what? God doesn't see my failures, he sees my future. That's an amazing thing. That's something that when the devil starts throwing a dart going, no, God doesn't love you, you can say, I've got the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He loves me with an everlasting love. See, it, it does that. It goes and it, it kills that whole doubt. But it also makes us stand firm in the life that we're living. Because it makes us remember that we can actually live the life that God has called us to live. That we can live in victory for Jesus Christ. That we can live in such a manner that is pleasing to God. Not because of our own strength, but because of the strength of God. Just a few scriptures. I'm going to skip around and then I'm going to be done. Romans 8. Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What shall we say to those things if God is for us? Who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, 
but delivered him over for us all. How will not also, uh, he not also, with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Paul wrote down and said, look, you got Christ. The breastplate of righteousness is right on you. Don't worry about anything the devil might say because it doesn't stick to you. Because when God looks at you, he does not look at your failures. He looks at Christ's righteousness. So what do we do in all of this? We make sure that we fill ourselves, that we fill our hearts with what is good and what is right and what is righteous. Psalm 119, uh, one of the latter verses right there. And actually, I want to let me go to Proverbs 4, 23 real quick. It says, Watch it out over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. We have to watch ourselves. we got to make sure that within our hearts and within our lives, there are good things. That means we've got to weed the garden. How many of y'all have ever weeded a garden before? You know, like, woo, I like weeding a garden. Never like weeding. But what happens when you weed a garden? When it's really well done? What happens? Well, it looks good. You can see your vegetables. <laughs> it looks good. And you, see, you can see your vegetables. Does it help the vegetables? Because it's not like all the other stuff is not sucking the water from them. It can grow better, right? And you also, once you weed everything, it's less likely that more weeds will come. Now, weeds are going to come. But it's a whole lot easier because you don't have the other ones that are there. That's what the scriptures compel us to do. Psalm 119 and verse 11. Your word have I... What version do y'all have? What, what, what do y'all say from that? Your word, thy word have I blank in my heart that I might not sin against them. There's a lot of different translations, and all of them are really good. Your word have I hidden in my heart. Your word have I treasured in my heart. Your word, I, I love your word have I treasured in my heart. Because when we treasure something, we put it in a great place. We, we look at it. We, um, we cherish it in so many different ways. You know, it's one of the things we need to do. We need to cherish God's Word. Here, here's where I want to kind of end tonight. So much information, but I'm just going to end on one little verse. Philippians 4 and verse 8. It's in your notes there. Philippians 4 and 8. It says, Finally, brothers... Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. It's a great little passage. And the idea of what Paul is getting at here is he's saying, all right, look, I want to make sure that you stay on target for, for what you're doing in your life to make sure the breastplate of righteousness stays on. One of the things is weeding out the bad things in your life, but also making sure the good things are all there. What does he say? He says, put all of these good things in there. These are the blanks here. The first one is true. Whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is good, it must agree with the truths revealed in the scriptures to be consistent with the teachings of Christ. If it's not, we've got to reject it and say, wait a minute, hold on, that's going to re lead me down the wrong pathway. We've got to keep the things that are true. Beyond that, honorable. Honorable. The, the word combines the meaning of the sense of, of gravity and dignity. It's treating serious matters seriously. It's not taking lightly or treating lightly things, um, it, it's not treating things lightly that are very important. You know, I, I when Allison and I 
We're going to have grace. We, we have long, long talks about, okay, we're going to have a child. What do we want this child to look like? What, what values do we want to instill? What do we hope for our child? Because we knew that the, one of the most important things we will ever do in our life is raise our child. We kept it important. And you know what? The idea of honorable is keeping important things important. Whatever is just, whatever is just and fair, not, respe not respecting um, the rights and feelings of others, but rather are just. It's not, um, it, if it's unfair or demeaning to others, it ought not be in our heads and our hearts. Pure, morally upright, lovely, number five, things that serve to cultivate and increase love and goodwill between people. Number six, commendable, things that tend to get and establish a good name and make us well spoken of. Number seven, excellent, anything that promotes the general good and well-being of society, and finally worthy of praise, anything that God himself would applaud or reward. That's the idea here of this whole passage. That it, the idea of, of making sure in our, home, in our own life, we're saying, okay, I'm weeding the garden of my life. I'm going to be thinking about those things that are good and those things that are right and those things that are just, and I'm going to fill my life with those so the other things don't have any power. Yes, the interesting thought when we're talking about armor. When we have armor, you know, usually we're not, not scared of a lot of the things that are out there. We're not really scared about everything else that can come our way, all because we have the armor. You know, you can go down to uh, Fort Fisher Aquarium, uh, just a little bit beyond uh, Curry Beach and Carolina Beach down in North Carolina, and you can actually go and they have tank, uh, the huge tank, where there are actually sharks that are, that are in them. And, uh, you know, if you have a little girl that might be uh, scared of sharks, you might like, not like seeing them. You know, it should be a whole lot scarier if they didn't have a big old piece of plexiglass keeping them back. You can go up to what is scary knowing full well that that glass is there. When you're thinking about the idea of the armor of God, that's why we put it on. Because out in this world, there are a lot of scary things. There's a lot of things that aim and target us. But you know what? When we're out and about, when we're going around and we're saying, you know what? It's not my righteousness, but it's Christ's righteousness. And the fiery darts of the devil, the arrows that are shot our way, that try to demean us and try to bring us down. We have to remember when we look back and we go, wait a minute here, hold on. It's not about me. It's about Him. And I am accepted through the blood of Christ. I'm able to stand because of the blood of Christ. I'm able to do these things because of the blood of Christ. And the Holy Spirit empowers me to live the life that I would have. My encouragement for each and every one of us here today is to remember that. To remember the blood of Christ that covers us, that gives us that righteousness, that right standing. That when we're able to come before anything we face out in life that says, oh, you're not good enough, or oh, hey, you've got enough strength, we can go, no, 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 look. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. It's about Him living through me. Questions, comments, observations. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you again for this night. Thank you for the opportunity we've had to, to be together, to laugh a little, to learn, and to look to you. I pray now that as we leave this place, you would be glorified, that you would be magnified, Father, I pray that you would give us safety in our journeys, 
that we might come back again to worship you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. To all those that were watching on Facebook, thank you so much. We hope the Lord bless you through our service here tonight.